disappointed that that's gone down because I had to hope that the damned will be on top of the pops this week. But it's not to be. Welcome, Dave Vanian. How Hello. Are you? Good morning. I'm very well. Looking very stunning, and I'm very envious of your shirt or blouse. Where did you get it from? What's left of it? Well, uh, Laurie, my wife, made this actually. Very, it's very good with the old needle and thread. What's it made out of? Because it looks really old. Can I feel it? Yeah, feel it, by all means. It's like Terry Wogan's knees, isn't it? <laughs> but much nicer. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we were having a very morbid conversation there because I was asking you if it was true that you were once a grave digger. And Which you said, yeah. it certainly was, yeah, for uh, about a year and a half, two years. I did it because it, um, it was in between. It was those times when you get in a dead-end job, if you pardon the pun. And uh, oh <laughs> I was, I was, you know, just it was a quiet place to think and decide what to do next. Basically, it fitted perfectly. Except I used to sing a lot when I was in there, so I used to disturb people now and again. But no one that was actually sleeping at the time in our know, underground, as it were. Did it ever um, depress you, or did was it ever morbid? It's funny. It's it's not like that because it's it's the people that go there to visit are usually quite jolly people you know had a few odd experiences but nothing uh like what you know. well the worst one really was um there was an old guy that used to come to the graveyard often we used to see him and he died and they had his funeral it was all very sad just a few people and then the week after his funeral we saw him come to the grave and visit and what we didn't know is all the time we'd been working there had a twin brother oh <laughs> Oh dear, <laughs> that shocked me and I didn't even oh. see him. <laughs> uh, he used to maintain that if you put your um, ear to the grave of his brother, you could hear his pocket watch ticking as well. Very strange. Did it put you off being buried? I mean, did it sort of make you think that you'd like to be cremated? No, not really. It didn't put me off. It was quite... It was, it was okay. It was a good job at the time. As you were saying before, though, that you'd like to have a... What was it, a memorial stone? Yeah, it? I'd like to have a memorial stone where you could, you know, put a few... I don't know, put five pence in or something and see a video playback of the of the band or something. It'd be great. You know, this is how we were when we were alive, folks. And, uh, could you imagine damned records blaring out over the Oh, I could, actually. That'd be great. <laughs> Wake a few people up. So what sort of things were you thinking about? Because you said it gave you time to think and plan on what you wanted to do. What were you thinking of? Well, it was just, a, you know, what was next. And what was next was starting the band, basically, and getting in the group. And it gave me a lot of time to... Because I could do the work early in the morning, knock off, and get into London and do, because it was outside of London, about 40 miles out, and, uh, and uh, meet people and stuff. It worked very well. So when was this? What year were you grave digging? Uh, this must have been 75. And the Damned got together in 77? 76. 76. Yeah. So it's almost a decade of the Dam now, almost 10 years. And 11 managers? Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, Numerous record commitments, contracts, you name it, we've gone through it. Why have you gone through so many things, like a dose of salt? <laughs> I think because a lot of people saw The Damned as an easy way of making some fast money and getting out quick, you know. Uh, and we were very unlucky in the fact that we decided to go s with independence and, and people that, uh, I don't know, every group's been ripped off at the beginning, though. You know, Malcolm McLaren managed you, didn't he, before you? Very did, briefly, yeah. very briefly for a, for a while, but it was before we were actually the damned. It was still myself, Rat, and Captain, and it was uh, Chrissy Hind was the guitarist at the time. She wouldn't sing. I kept saying to her, you've got a great voice. I used to go down at underground stations and things, she'd burst out these huge uh, voice singing, and we said, you know, you've got to get in, but she wouldn't. Of course, years later, she became famous with the Pretenders. So... It didn't last, you know, it, the reason we were with Malcolm, one of the reasons was was good because we had cheap rehearsal time in an old church that we never paid for. And, but uh, we almost were the Sex Pistols. Really? And the Sex Pistols were almost the damn. The names were almost changed. Very weird. How did you end up being the damned and how did they end up being the Sex Pistols? Well, it, was, it wasn't so much, it was, it was just that the names were picked at the same times, but they weren't decided upon, you know. Like Brian really picked the name for the band. Never really knew why he picked the damn, but it did fit uh, after the years of 11 managers, as you say. And you've never been tempted to change it or anything like that? No, yeah, no. Good. Another lesser known fact was Sid Vicious was almost the damn's lead singer, but he didn't turn up for the audition, so he didn't get it. You're joking. Yeah. Uh, Gosh, things could have been really, really different. It could have been it? very strange. Yeah. I mean, pop history could have been quite, quite different. Completely warped. Yeah. I wonder what it would would have happened had Sid Vicious been singer with the Damned. <laughs> I, I mean, would the whole Sex Pistols thing been the Damned thing or what? Who knows? Who can say? Yeah, I don't know.
Well, let's have your first piece of music, which is a track by The Rattles called The Witch. Why do you like this? Ah, oh, it's great, great song. Because um, it's still quite fresh when you listen to it now. And you know, it doesn't sound dated at all. And it's got those manic screams. I'm a sucker for those manic sort of screams and things. Okay, manic screams. Here strings as well. The strings, listen for the strings. And the strings and everything else. <laughs> And the witch. We were going to play the album version of that, which was our copy, but you decided that it was a different mix. Yeah, it definitely is a, a better sound, this one, yeah, from what I heard from the one you played. I don't even know they had an album, I just <laughs> remember them for that one single. Actually, I should have put it back in the box. They seem to fade into obscurity. 1971. Oh. That particular album. All the rattles as well. When did you get into music? Because we were just saying now about dance sets and things like that, how good they were, the fact that you could oh, play seven great. singles at yeah. once. I wish you could do that. I, I, I love a dance set. Did anyone ever make a record on 16, though? They always had that speed. I don't think they did. I don't think they did, did they? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. So it would probably be terrible quality as well. But were you into music when you were at school? Well, it's funny, because I started off... Um, first brush with music was classical music. Because I remember there was this teacher that used to uh, spell off all these uh, Greek legends, you know, the myths of uh, Orpheus and the Underworld and all mm. these things. And, it, and he used to always play the Planet Suite. Mm. And I, you know, that was my first sort of thing. Um, but my parents were always playing dodgy uh, 50s and 60s things like Freddie Cannon, you know, Way Down Yonder in New Orleans and all those things. And my dad used to sing that when he washed the dishes. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> and they had a whole pile of 78s as well with these really weird... Um, German tangos and things that were great, really good, good stuff. But uh, I've, yeah, I've always liked music. Apparently, when I was in the cot, I was always banging things and singing, uh, singing along. Had you always wanted to be in a band, or was there any other ambition that you had? Uh, pff, no, I, did, I was unsure of exactly what I was going to do. I always knew I had to be able to do something that would give me, uh, you know, a certain amount of freedom, free reign to do. And as much as I could in whatever way. Because I'd, like, I'd really like to do film soundtracks one day. Something we'd like to move into. Does music actually give you freedom, though? I mean, haven't you got lots and lots of deadlines and things to meet? Yeah, but it opens a few doors as well, mm. you know. Because it's such a sort of... Uh, I mean, it's it's very connected, the movie business and the, and the music business. So that's handy for me because I've always been a... You know, a big sort of film fan and stuff. That's why I've picked two uh, soundtrack albums on this thing. What's your favourite all-time movie? 
Well, that's a really difficult one in all time movie. Well, do you have favourite actors or actresses? Yeah, people like, I don't know, anyone Orson Welles even. I love I loved Citizen Kane. Mm. The music in that's great, the way it's shot. But uh, but now the Britain's turning out some good films again. I mean, Company of Wolves was great. A really good film. Take do, my hat off to them. Do you ever go to see a movie, though? And because you'd like to do a film soundtrack, do you ever look and listen and think, I wouldn't have done it like that? Oh, I don't know. It depends. Uh, it's not so much I wouldn't have done it that way, but you kind of think, if I had the chance, you know, what you would do. That's a great thing. Yeah. This next piece of music is from an album called uh, Christine, the soundtrack to Christine, and it's the, the Viscounts and Harlem Nocturne. Yeah. I don't know anything about it. Well, it's just a, a really old sort of 60s band. They did, they did quite a lot of things. But this has got a great sax solo, a real sort of sexy, laid-back sax, which is marvellous. Okay. Um, that's the Viscounts from an album called uh, Christine She nearly Sanchez. didn't make it there. <laughs> Headphones were off. <laughs> I can't remember what we were talking about then. Status quo, I think. No, no you were. You're talking about the stranglers. <laughs> Was I? Something like that. Um, your next piece of, of music is from a movie as well, isn't it? Is it from a I movie? I don't know what the next piece of music is. Oh, sorry. It's I Tom think it's Jones Tom Jones. And Jones. What, you yeah. I didn't, yeah, it's Pussycats. Yeah, that's right. It was a movie. It was a movie. But yeah. an awful movie. I thought it was great. Movie. It was really good. I had Peter Sellers running around as a mad uh, psychiatrist. That's right. And his was wife was this sort of Brunhilde figure. Yeah. With the horns on her head and stuff. Yeah. Pete, um, Peter O'Toole. He always. It? Yeah, he was the he was the star yeah. in it. He always, when he was uh, young. Always, I thought uh, there was a resemblance between him and Captain. If you ever look. Oh yes, yes. yes both yes, got big do. noses. <laughs> <laughs> but Tom Jones, I mean, do you admire his his vocal quality or what? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I just think this is a really good song. I mean, it's it's just a great song the way he does it. And I thought I'd play this for Bryn and Jug since they're both Welsh. Okay, Tom Jones. What's new, Pussycat? All right. What's new, Pussycat? Tom 
Tom Jones. Um, what's new, Pussycat? And you were saying that there's a resemblance between Tom Jones and Prince. I think so, yeah, definitely, in his, in his, <laughs> in his expressions. Because you went to see Purple Rain the other night. Yeah, yeah. What was it like? You better say it's good, because we're giving three <laughs> three copies of that. Well, I, actually, I actually, you know, I mean, Prince gets a lot of slag in, but I actually quite enjoy what he does, because he looks like a man who's enjoying himself. Mm. And that's, I think that's good. There's no doubt about the fact that he, I mean, he's very, yeah. very talented. Oh, absolutely. And he, he puts, uh, you know, he puts over a show, he works tremendously hard. I think he puts a lot back into what's been missing in music for a while. And I wouldn't like to see a million princes, but as, as one, he's great. Is it something that you like doing, performing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, I don't, Janice, <laughs> to be honest. No, I mean, you know, obviously sort of, um, you know... Th th you're making records. It's, well, it's like the icing on the cake, songs, really. Is it? Uh, yeah, it is. Because I love being in the studio and working as well, but uh, oh, it's phenomenal when you're out. And especially if you're um, in a, a large hall and you can see that everyone's moving, even at the back, up in the back seats. And it's like a big mess of... And if you've ever been to a damn concert, it's like a, a strange thing, you know. But you still get a thrill out of it after nine years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's different every time. Uh -huh. Although it sounds like a terrible cliche, that but it really is. Uh, Tell me about human expression. The human expression. Mm. Not, not don't know too much about them except they're lumped together with a million other uh, independent label '60s garage bands. You know, like Fane Jade and The Seed, Shadows of Night, all those kind of people. People down at Alice in Wonderland will probably enjoy this song. And this is Love at a Psychedelic Velocity. a band from Los Angeles called The Human Expression and that was Love at a Psychedelic Velocity. There's me and there's Dave Vanian uh, from the Dan. We're talking about music and he's playing some of his favourite records. Do you buy a lot of records? As many as I, I can. I don't buy... Um, what I tend to do is spend ages not buying and then have to go out and buy a whole bunch at once. You know? But uh, because a lot of things I like are these dodgy 60s things, it's better to do something like go to America when you're on tour and look in you know, places like, I don't know, New Jersey, Minneapolis, Chicago, where no one wants the stuff anyway, and you can pick it up for like 99 cents or a dollar. 
but you come back with so much uh, luggage, uh, so heavy, because you, you're doing so three weeks, so you buy all the stuff in the first week, spend all your wages on records, don't eat instead, <laughs> and then you end up sort of carrying them around for the next two weeks. But it's, yeah. I find the odd things, though, here, though. I mean, found Shadows of Night songs in Glasgow and things, cheap, because no one knew what they were at the time. But there's, since this big revival thing's mm. happened, and... People have rediscovered the garage bands that put all the prices up, unfortunately. Do you actually have time, though, to listen to all of the records that you buy? Uh, there is a few I've put away recently that I haven't heard yet. Uh, I do, yeah, I do, because I carry the old Walkman around with me and I tape everything and play Because you're always travelling to and from, so then you get a chance to listen, which is good. Is your collection very organised? I mean, do you file them all away and that sort of mm, stuff? No, it's not very organised, really. It's 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 more kind of there's a whole bunch up front of the ones I play the most and then the rest just get shoved in wherever they are. Didn't you almost lose a pile once in a flood or something? Yeah, well I got flooded uh, flooded three times when I used to live in a basement and they all were floating out the door one day. You know, that's why it, these sleeves which I've got before me for people who can't see on the radio have got these holes in where they were hung up to dry. Oh, the sleeves. But they survived. Yeah. Some of them did. Not all of them. Some of them had so filthy things stuck to them that wouldn't even clean off. Yeah. <laughs> so. A lady with a great voice is Peggy Lee. Marvellous voice, yeah. Uh, uh, the great thing about this song is it, it just, the tempo doesn't slack all the way through it. It's really pacey. I mean, when people talk about punk music and things, I think this sticks with that ideal more than anything, you know, because it just doesn't let up. It's the opening that gets me. Oh, it's great. Peggy Marvelous. Lee, lover. they left anything out of that, no, did they? everything. I think anyone who heard that would have to surrender after hearing that. It's great. Oh, wonderful. Lady with a marvellous voice. Yeah, Peggy Lee yeah. and Lover. Working in music, listening to music, do you get time to do anything else at all? Mm, not a lot, actually, these days. Uh, music pretty much takes up 24 hours of my time now. And it will do for the next two years, I'm sure. You know, I'll try and take the band off the... the uh, get them off the ground. You're in the studios at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, we're just in with a producer called John Kelly, uh, recording the new album, and it's going very well, very well. You had Bob Sargent for the single, didn't you? We did, yeah. So why did you pick another guy for the album? Uh, well, Bob was just picked basically for that one single thing. He wasn't, you know, it wasn't set for the album. And uh, there's one, we did quite a lot of work with him. It's really co-produced, that one. Whereas John Kelly's in there and producing it. He's very, very good. He's used to work with Paul McCartney and people like that, so Kate Bush and things. It's going very well. When will the album be ready? Well, hopefully it will be released around June, so I don't know. We're working very fast, obviously, because we've got the tour and, the, you know, the old schlepping around Europe and America, everything coming up, so that's all looking good. Very exciting. Next piece of music is uh, by John Carpenter, and it's the soundtrack from Halloween, isn't it? The theme. It's the main theme, yeah. Which is, uh, it's great. Every it's it's unusual for um, a film director also write the music, which he seems to do quite a lot. He did it on The Fog and uh, Assault on Precinct Thirteen. So not only is he, um, I mean, Halloween really started the spate of these new films with you know, people running around. Who was in this one? I think I was just... Jamie Lee Curtis. That's right. The ba when she was babysitting. That's right, six. yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a really good film. Uh, That's it's, right. It's, it started off a lot of imitators that never actually managed to, to make a film with the same suspense because you actually get to know these characters instead of, you know, people getting chopped up without you even knowing who they are so you don't care. But the music especially really lifts it out. There's lots of uh, what they call stingers at the right places. You know, like, it's a lot like Psycho in a way. Because if, if you watch Psycho without the music, it wouldn't be as good. No, it's still a good film, but it's the music that builds the suspense and the tension. I remember seeing this and I was terrified to go to bed. What, Halloween? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great film.
without seeing the pictures, that's spooky, isn't it? That's John Carpenter no. and the theme from Halloween. You're doing a session for us on Sunday, aren't we? We certainly are. We're going to give you, I don't know, how many? Three gems, are we? Four, please. Four? <laughs> Good. Four. Great. I'll crack the wick. Uh, cr crack crack, crack the, wick. the wick. And demand four. <laughs> so when does the tour start? Well, the tour starts around uh, the 25th, I think, of uh, next month. And that's going to be a 40 day tour taking in all points north of the compass, etc., etc. Uh, in fact, you're touring with a band that we're going to play later, aren't you? Well, so it seems. We're having the fuzz tones with us, a uh, uh, dodgy American band. <laughs> 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 now, they play, they play a lot of 60s, uh, uh, 60s covers, uh, pebbles like, like Love at Psychedelic Velocity, that type of thing. And the 40 dates, will they all be... I can see John time. Peel poking his head around the corner. <laughs> what are you doing? I wanted to know what it was you were going to do to that whip. <laughs> we were talking about just a moment ago. There's something wrong with my radio in the other room. I must have misheard you. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Well, that's, a big, <laughs> that's a complete breakdown at the BBC here while we talk about whips and handcuffs and... Um, the, the <laughs> Come on, Janice, professional. <laughs> the body dance in this country. Uh, don't tie me up again, come on. <laughs> um, yes, yes they are. Right, right, right. okay. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you this evening. <laughs> and this next track, uh, another over-the-top production, a bit like the Peggy Lee Absolutely. and Lover thing. It's Barry Ryan and Eloise. I think um, Barry Ryan uh, and Paul Ryan have been sadly forgotten. You know, everyone waxes lyrical about Scott Walker, which I think was marvellous. But uh, I think this is absolutely superb. Great singers. Very strange personality, though. Apparently Paul wrote most of the lyrics and was slightly towards the end a bit unhinged and if you listen to the songs it, it comes out you know there's a, a tension in there it starts off with what you think is going to be a pretty song and it doesn't it grabs you after a while whose sons were they mary and uh ryan I think. that's it yeah because they were quite famous. they were great oh, yeah. they? they'll probably be rediscovered soon I think. well as i say it's been a pleasure dave yeah. and uh, is it back to the studio now or what uh no, only if you're going to crack the <laughs> crack the whip again. I think we should give up. This is Barry Ryan, Eloise. Cheers. Well.
to stay. 